For more physics related content, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 3C. In this video, I will derive the equations of hydrostatic equilibrium in general relativity. The math in this video is not particularly difficult, but it does require some knowledge of general relativity. As such, I rated the physics level in this video as expert. If you don't know anything about general relativity, you can still follow along, but you'll likely have some difficulty fully understanding where some of these physics concepts come from. Let's start off by going over some of the assumptions we're making in this video. When we looked at hydrostatic equilibrium in Newtonian gravity, we assumed that the star was static, that it was spherically symmetric, and that general relativity could be ignored, meaning that this quantity, called the metric deviation, was much less than 1. In this video, we're going to forego this last assumption. In the Newtonian derivation, we also assumed a polytrope relation in what was called the standard model of stars. We won't be making use of those assumptions in this video. First thing we have to do is set up our space-time geometry. So let's start off by going over what's called the Schwarzschild metric. And we're going to specifically look at a non-vacuum solution. So if you've done any general relativity, you're probably familiar with the Schwarzschild metric for a vacuum solution, meaning outside of the star. Now we're going to do the same thing, but we're not in a vacuum, we're inside the star. In a Schwarzschild geometry, the space-time interval will have the following form. So ds squared is the space-time interval, so essentially it's the distance traveled in space and time, and that is invariant to all observers. So everyone will agree on this value. d omega squared here is the standard spherical coordinate angular components, and we know it has this form because we've assumed spherical symmetry. That also means that there are no cross terms in here involving, say, a dt d theta or dt d phi or dr d theta dr d phi, and that the rest of the functions in the metric, this e to the lambda and e to the nu, cannot depend on either theta or phi. Now, I've written these functions e to the nu and e to the lambda in this form. They don't need to be written in this form, but it's somewhat conventional to do so because it makes the math a little simpler. Since we're in hydrostatic equilibrium, we're also assuming a static solution. So that means there can be no time dependence anywhere in the metric. It also means that since r does not depend on time, that there is no cross term in here involving a dt dr, only the dt squared dr squared. So our metric is diagonal. In this video, I'm going to use a Schwarzschild metric because most people who have done general relativity are familiar with it. But I would like to bring up a different metric, which I prefer, which is called the May and White metric. Now you can see that it's also spherically symmetric. We have the same r squared d omega squared, and there's no theta dependence or phi dependence anywhere, and there are no cross terms with angular components. So the geometry is spherically symmetric, just as in the Schwarzschild metric. But for the radial coordinate, I'm using the rest mass enclosed, which I've labeled m naught. And I like this better because the rest mass enclosed is invariant to all observers. So what is the rest mass enclosed? It's just the total amount of particles enclosed multiplied by their mass. So everyone has to agree on this because all you're doing is counting up the particles and adding up their mass. So if one observer counts 25 enclosed protons, everyone else has to count 25 protons. The R coordinate, the Schwarzschild R coordinate, is not invariant to all observers. So different observers will measure different distances, and they will not necessarily agree with the distances measured by the R coordinate in the Schwarzschild metric. You'll also notice that in the May and White metric we have time dependence. That's because this metric is generally used for a spherical collapse, so not for hydrostatic equilibrium. But you can get back the hydrostatic equilibrium equations, which we're going to derive using the Schwarzschild metric, by just setting all your time derivatives to zero. If you were to forego the static assumption for the Schwarzschild metric, now your r position would depend on time, and you'd have to include a dt dr cross term in the space time interval. And so now your metric would no longer be diagonal, and that would complicate the math quite a bit. So it's basically a more general form of the Schwarzschild metric, 
with a more intuitive radial component because everyone can understand what mass enclosed means. You're just counting up the amount of mass enclosed. So I'm not going to use the main white metric, even though I prefer it myself, because probably more people are familiar with the Schwarzschild metric. But if you want to know more about the main white metric, you can look up its derivation in this paper, Hydrodynamic Calculations of General Relativistic Collapse by May and White. So now we have to solve for these functions, e to the nu and e to the lambda, given an energy mass distribution. But before we do that, we need to go over the difference between rest mass and gravitational mass. Because in general relativity, you have to be careful about what do you mean by mass. So we have a space-time interval in a Schwarzschild geometry. But the radial coordinate r we're using does not measure proper length. That's why this dr term is scaled by this function e to the lambda. The proper length, which is the length measured by a local observer, which I'm going to call dr naught, is the Schwarzschild coordinate scaled by the square root of e to the lambda. So here it's dr squared, and we're multiplied by e to the lambda, so we just take the square root of this to get a square root of e to the lambda in front of the dr term here. The reason these differ is that the r coordinate has curvature or encodes curvature, and that's what we experience as gravity. So let me draw a diagram to help visualize this. If this is our star, and we pick some radial position r, and inside that there is some enclosed mass. If you were to walk along this line and measure the distance you've traveled locally, you would be measuring proper distance, and that would not be equal to this radial position r. And as a result, the mass enclosed will not be equal to the rest mass enclosed. The gravitational mass, which is what determines the space-time curvature, is just the total mass energy content. E equals mc squared, so anything with energy counts as mass and will contribute to gravity. In order to get this, you just integrate the total energy density over the volume. So that would mean you integrate the rest mass density, which I've called R0, and you have to include any thermal energy or internal energy. So if your material is at non-zero temperature, that's got energy, and you have to include that in this integral. And you're going to integrate over a Schwarzschild coordinate volume. That mass, which I'm calling the gravitational mass, sometimes it's referred to as the total mass energy content, is what determines gravity. So you can measure this mass by looking at orbiting objects. So for example, when we look at a planet orbiting the sun, and we then use this orbit to infer the mass of the sun, we're measuring the gravitational mass of the sun, not its rest mass. If you want to know the total rest mass enclosed, which is just the total number of particles multiplied by their mass, you have to integrate the total rest mass density over the proper volume, meaning over the locally measured volume. So we integrate the rest mass density, and we have to include this factor of e to the lambda in our volume to account for the fact that this r coordinate is not measuring local distances. And that is just equal to the number of baryons times the mass of the baryons. So mass of a proton is m sub p. Now, yes, it's true, there may be other particles like electrons that contribute to mass, but electrons are a thousand times lighter than baryons, so including them is just a small correction. And notice, we're not including this internal energy, because that's not part of rest mass. So another way to interpret the rest mass enclosed is the total rest mass in flat space, meaning without curvature, at zero temperature. Even though it's a much easier concept to understand, you're just counting up the number of particles and multiplying by their mass, it cannot be measured. There is no experiment I know of that could do this. I mean, in principle, you could measure it, but practically, I don't know how you would measure this. Either you'd have to go into the star and count up all the particles, which is not feasible experimentally, or you'd have to measure the mass of the star in flat space, and if it has some temperature, you subtract off that energy. But that would mean that if you wanted to know the rest mass of a star, you'd have to have measured it back before it had collapsed into a star and was a relatively unbound cloud in flat space. So while that's possible to do in principle, 
A gas cloud collapsing to a star can take millions of years, and for a human being, it's just not feasible to measure the mass of a gas cloud, wait around a million years until it collapses to a star, and then measure the mass again to see the difference between the gravitational mass and the rest mass. This difference between the two masses, between the rest mass and the gravitational mass, we define as the binding energy of the star, meaning it's the energy you'd have to put into the star to break it up. We'll look more into this when we discuss energy instability in stars. If you're enjoying this video so far, please be sure to like and subscribe, maybe share it with a few friends. Okay, now that we understand the difference between these two masses, let's take a look at the Einstein field equations. On the left hand side, we have the Einstein tensor, and this tells us about space time geometry, so this has information about the metric. On the right hand side, we have the mass energy distribution. So this is called the stress energy tensor. Again, if you don't know anything about general relativity, this is in a sense the relativistic version of Newton's law of gravitation. And if you don't understand this equation, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to solve it because it takes forever and it's extremely tedious. So I'm just going to set it up and then give you the results. So in order to go any further, we need to know what the mass energy distribution of the star is. So we need to know what the stress energy tensor is, that's T alpha beta. And we're going to assume a perfect fluid. So for a perfect fluid, the T00 component, which is the time time component, is just the total energy density. And then the spatial components, which are labeled as 1, 2, 3, so 0 refers to the time component, 1, 2, 3 refers to the three spatial components, those are all going to be negative of the pressure. And all of the off diagonal terms, so where alpha and beta are different, are going to be zero. And on top of the Einstein field equation, we're going to add one more equation, which is the continuity of the stress energy tensor. So this is the covariant derivative. It is equal to the regular derivative, plus these terms involving these gammas, which are called the Christoffel symbols, and they basically account for space-time curvature. In a flat universe, they would all be zero. Or more accurately, you could find a coordinate system where they would be zero. If your space-time has curvature, there is no coordinate system in which all of the Christoffel symbols are zero. And finally, I'm using the Einstein convention here for this notation, where when you see two indices that are equal, that is implying a sum. Again, if you don't really understand the math here, it doesn't really matter. I'm just showing it for those who are familiar with general relativity, so that they can see where all this is coming from. Okay, let's first look at the solution to the Einstein field equations. The G00 term will give the following equation. So this term here is G00, and here we have the 00, zero component of the stress energy tensor. I'm going to isolate the term with the e to the lambda on one side, and now I'm going to integrate over r. Now take a look at this integral here. This is just what we called the gravitational mass. So I can substitute that in and solve for e to the lambda. If you're familiar with the Schwarzschild coordinate in the vacuum solution, you'll actually recognize that these are the same. The only difference is that this mass here is now a function of r because it's enclosed mass, so that changes with your radial position. But in the case of the vacuum solution, the enclosed mass is a constant, so that's the only difference. Now let's take a look at the G11 solution. Again, on the left-hand side we have G11, and on the right side we have the 11 component of the stress energy tensor, which was just negative of the pressure. And I'm going to isolate this term d nu dr to get the following equation. I can't actually integrate this yet because I don't know what the pressure is. In order to get an equation for the pressure, I'm going to use the continuity of the stress energy tensor. So here's our equation for continuity. And we can simplify this by using the assumption that we have a static and spherically symmetric universe. So that means that all derivatives involving time or angular components have to be zero because the only thing that can change is the radial position. We also have that T alpha beta is zero if alpha does not equal beta. When we account for all of this, the continuity equation reduces to the following. 
Now notice these betas here, there's two of them, so they're dummy variables because you're summing over beta. Or in this case, this beta is not a dummy variable, it's actually the ones that are here. Just to remind you what the Christoffel symbols are, they're related to derivatives of the metric. And recall the metric only depends on r and its diagonal. So now our continuity equation will reduce even further because in this term, since here we have a one, that means alpha has to equal one. And alpha also has to equal one here because one refers to the spatial component and only the spatial derivatives are non-zero. So this term has to be dr of t11. Over here, beta has to be one since this term here is one or since this index is one. So that gives us this form here. And over here, beta has to equal alpha, because if it's not, then t alpha beta is zero. So that leads to this expression. The relevant non-zero Christoffel symbols turn out to be the following. Now you might notice that here I have a 0, 0, 1, a 2, 2, 1, a 3, 3, 1, but I don't have the 1, 1, 1. Because even though it is non-zero and does show up in this equation, it shows up both here, when alpha and alpha are one, and where all the alphas here are one, but they get subtracted off, so we don't care what it is. And just to remind you, T00 is the energy density, and TII, where I is one, two, or three, is the negative pressure. So when you plug all this in, it actually turns out that only this term survives. Everything else subtracts off. And we get the following equation, where the derivative of t11 is just the derivative of negative p. And then this term here is what survives from these two Christoffel symbol terms. Okay, we know what d nu dr is. We solved that on the previous board. So I can plug that in and get the following equation for hydrostatic equilibrium in general relativity. This equation is called the TOV equation, which is shorthand for tolman oppenheimer volkov equation. Now notice that in the Newtonian limit, meaning when all these terms in these parentheses are small, all of these parentheses reduce to one and we're just left with dpdr equals this term here. And that's the equation we found in stellar physics 3a for hydrostatic equilibrium in Newtonian gravity, where in the case of Newtonian gravity, this m will be m naught, so rest mass. And just like in the case of Newtonian gravity, if we want to solve this equation, we need an equation of state relating the pressure to the density. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe, and click the notification bell to be notified for the next video in the series, where I will be using the TOV equation to find the maximum mass of a neutron star.